For a discussion of disruption, dystopia, and decisions, please welcome back to the stage Singularity University's Chair for Entrepreneurship and Open Innovation, Pascal Finette. Wow, that's all the applause you can muster? Holy shit. Okay, I'm in trouble. <laughs> it's not going to be fun. All right, so uh, welcome, Edmonton and uh, welcome uh, Singularity U participants. Uh, one thing I just want to point out, because it, it seems to have caused some confusion, I am not Oren. This is Oren. <laughs> he just happens to look like me or vice versa. I am not that guy. Um, for better or worse, you will be the judge at the end of this uh, session. So what I want to do is I want to take you through a little bit of a closing session. And um, I had the great privilege and, and honor to be with Singularity for a couple years now and uh, working through a lot of like our executive programs, having seen those and really having formed an opinion or an idea on uh, what I think helps you kind of like make sense of this world. Before we get there, I want to uh, ask you a question. And the question is a little bit like this. Um, anyone feels like this cat at the moment? So you're kind of like taking all the information in, all this exponential stuff we talked about, like all the formulas and you're like getting ready to jump one more exponential trend and... <sighs> so feeling a bit like that, right? Um, so I want to take you on a journey and hopefully make a little bit more sense of this, uh, of this world. I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about disruption, uh, which is kind of like our topic here. I want to talk about dystopia because I think it's important. I want to talk about the decisions you're taking as an individual. So let's talk about disruption. By now, I'm pretty sure you have seen this curve enough times that you can uh, recite it, but also see it in your nightmares. Um, Hemingway wrote a book called The Sun Also Rises. In this book, he has a quote, the full quote, if you have never seen it, goes like this. How did you go bankrupt, Bill asks. Two ways, Sam responds, gradually and then suddenly. Now, please don't go bankrupt, but this is the way technology moves. This is the way these curves move. They move gradually and then suddenly. They've got this weird thing where it takes a long time for them to develop. These technologies it takes a long time for them to mature, and then it feels like stuff happens overnight. Of course, uh, you heard of uh, Ray Kurzweil, our co-founder. He wrote 25 years ago an essay called The Law of Accelerating Returns. I don't need to recite this for you, but I think there's something in there which a lot of us have not fully understood. And that is this. So in this essay, you find this notion that a lot of systems he sees, we're seeing in the world move on an exponential curve. By now, you should be able to like literally repeat this in your sleep. But I think the thing which people don't fully grok and people don't fully understand is that technology builds on top of technology. Technology enables technology and that creates the real exponential. Here's an example. This is population growth over time. And as you see, there's this like, interesting bending upwards. And that's, of course, the first agricultural revolution, the first time in human history that we as humans had enough time uh, to create enough calories to feed ourselves. So then we create more time. And with an abundance of time, what we do is we create more stuff. So we create the Stirling engine, the steam engine. And that gives us an abundance of muscle power. And then we start inventing more things. We start inventing electricity. And that gives us the ability to distribute power out. Ray Kurzweil has an interesting saying. You heard this on the stage probably a couple times. He says that the change we're seeing in the next 100 years equals the change we've seen in the last 20,000 years. Again, that sounds amazing when you're at a cocktail party and recite this. I still think that most of us don't fully understand it. And it took me years to really get behind this. Here's how this works in the real world. Imagine, and this is a little crazy, imagine we invent a time machine. So we're creating this crazy little device we call a time machine. And with this time machine, we do something bizarre. We don't go into the future, but we bring back an old friend. We bring back Jane Austen, who lived in London in 1700. And Jane Austen, of course, wrote Pride and Prejudice and many other books. Now, imagine we bring Jane to Edmonton today, 250, 300 years later. Like, how do you think she would perceive the world? She would basically, if you put her in the town square here in Edmonton, she would probably kneel over and die of shock because the change she experiences is so dramatic. In 1700, they didn't even have electricity, right? So let's assume for a second that Jane miraculously survives this experience and comes to us and says, like, can I have your time machine? And I want to do the same thing. I want to surprise one of my friends and do the same thing. So 
we give her a time machine, she repeats the experiment back in London in 1700, and she brings back an old friend of hers, the Mona Lisa. The Mona Lisa lived in, in Italy about like 1500. Now the Mona Lisa comes to London in 1700, and how do you think the Mona Lisa perceives London? She will walk through the streets of London and say, well, the political system has changed, and you've got the Stirling engine, the steam engine, and that's about it, because nothing has changed.